Uh, welcome back everybody to another lecture here in History 1301 and today we're going to be going over the Federalist era, the period that immediately follows the ratification of the U.S. Constitution. Now the U.S. Constitution, it will be formally ratified in the summer of 1788 when the ninth state, New Hampshire, ratifies it. However, we'll see in the coming months several other states will also ratify it. But with the, uh, with the uh, nine states now approving of the U.S. Constitution, it would then go into effect the following March in 1789 and inaugurate a new type of government that has governed the U.S. up to this present day. However, as we enter this new period, as we turn the chapter and seeing how this government functions, everybody was pretty questionable on whether or not it would be a successful governmental body. Many, especially over in Europe, believed that it would ultimately fail. And so as we've talked about before, while it was one thing for the uh, Constitutional Convention to create a new constitution, it was another thing to ensure that the Republic would run smoothly under the Constitution. And it would be left up to the Washington, Adams, and later the Jefferson's administration to ensure that um, this constitution would run smoothly, or this new government would run smoothly. However, today we're going to be mainly focusing on the Washington and Adams administration, and collectively they fall under what's called the Federalist Era, to where we see the first two administrations as they begin to interpret the comp uh, Constitution, and as they begin to operate the federal government, they will look to expand the federal government, hence the name the Federalist. Now, before we start talking about the period from a chronological perspective, I want to take a look at the main two political factions that will emerge after we see the ratification of the Constitution. Because just like today, not everybody is going to agree on how the Constitution should be interpreted. Some will believe that the government should at times be able to bend what it says within the Constitution to push forth their policy, while another faction is going to believe that you should strictly listen to and follow by the guidelines that are put forth in the Constitution. The first group I want to point out, in which this era is uh, essentially named after, and the group that will come to dominate the 1790s, is that of the Federalists. Now, we've already been introduced to the Federalists just a little bit in the previous lecture. Uh, the Federalists, they had supported at the Constitutional Convention the Constitution itself. And they support a strong federal government, something that we'll continue to see moving forward into the Federalist period. They will call for the creation of a national bank. They would call for the creation of new institutions and expanding the, federal, the federal bureaucracy as well as the federal government's power. Now, the key players within the Federalist Party during the 1790s will continue to be Alexander Hamilton, but we'll also see that John Adams, who will become America's first vice president, and eventually the uh, second president of the United States, he will also be another major leader of this faction. However, the party early on is really going to center around Alexander Hamilton. We'll talk more about why that is here in just a little bit. Now, the other major political faction that we see emerge during this period is going to be a group known as the Jeffersonians or known in their time simply as the Republicans. Now, before I start diving deeper into this group, I want to make it clear. I will refer to them as the Republicans. However, this is not the modern Republican Party. This is a precursor to the modern Republican Party. The modern Republican Party won't be founded until the 1850s. But rather, this is the party of Jeff Jefferson, who would call for a weaker centralized government. They will believe that the Constitution should be strictly followed. That you should not create institutions that were not directly mentioned within the Constitution. And they will call for lesser taxes and they will call for the destruction of the Bank of the United States when we talk about that here in just a moment. Now the key players within this faction are going to be, as you can probably guess by the name, Thomas Jefferson and then also um, James Madison. Now, Madison's an interesting character because whenever we talked about him uh, last time, we saw him as a part of the Federalist faction. Well, because of his politics of his state in Virginia, his attitudes are going to change because he realizes in his state, Virginia, it's not necessarily popular to promote a stronger centralized government. But anyways, these are going to be the two major political factions that we see emerge after the creation of the U.S. Constitution. However, they will really won't come to prominence until we get to the 17, 1791, 1792 and so on and so forth. But they will create a very hostile political atmosphere during the 1790s as both of them struggle for power. But anyways, now that we have a baseline of who the two major political players will be during this period, let's start talking about the Federalist era and how it's inaugurated. 
Now, the Federalist era will begin with the Washington administration. Now, Washington himself, you could not characterize him in either one of these groups, mainly because throughout his political career, he's going to rise above the political noise. However, if you had to label him as one of these two, you probably would label him in the Federalist category, as he will be heavily influenced by his Secretary of the Treasury, that of uh, Alexander Hamilton. But anyways, Washington will take the presidential oath of office in April, or on April 30th, 1789, and he would inaugurate the Federalist era. He would inaugurate the uh, new uh, federal government. Now, why is Washington the first president in the United States? Well, it's mainly because the Constitution itself, when it was being constructed, it was built to basically have Washington as the first president. He is chosen by the delegates as well as the Electoral College because they understood that he had relinquished power after the revolution and they realized at some point he would relinquish the presidency. I don't know if I had mentioned this when we talked about the constitution, but when it was first drafted, there were no limitations on the amount of uh, terms that a president could serve. Their terms would be four years and you'd have to be reelected every four years. However, technically a president could serve th three, four, five, six. They could serve as president for life. And this is what made many people suspicious of this office. However, by making Washington the first uh, president under this new constitution, this really calmed many of those sus suspicions. But anyways, Washington will begin his administration in April 1789. And the first year of his administration is really just trying to ensure what the executive department will look like, how the branches of government would flow, and so on and so forth. However, the most significant thing that will occur in the early days of his administration is the fact that he's going to create something that was not created by the, um, by the US Constitution he's going to create his own uh, presidential cabinet. Now, when he creates this new presidential cabinet, he's going to create, or he's gonna call on Congress to create some of the same departments that were under the Articles government to be represented in the executive branch. And at the head of each one of these departments would be a secretary. And at first there will be four major departments. However, that number will grow as the federal bureaucracy as well as the nation begins to grow. But the initial members of his cabinet would prove to be under, at the Treasury Department, Alexander Hamilton. He would have a State Department who would be see uh, Thomas Jefferson as his first Secretary of State. You would have the War Department, which would be headed by uh, Henry Knox, a former uh, um, Lieutenant of Washington during the Revolution. And lastly, as his first uh, Attorney General, it'd be Edmund Randolph. Now, with these individuals in place, his cabinet, the purpose for it was to basically serve as his advisor. So that way he could uh, seek out their advice on foreign and domestic policies. However, as we can already see from the board, his cabinet is going to be divided in the days to come because he appoints the two main leading individuals of these two rival fractions to two prominent positions within his cabinet. Now, why does he do this? Well, it's because he wasn't really concerned necessarily with one's political viewpoint, but rather whether or not this individual had the merit and the qualifications to run that office. He was a man that could find talent, and he recognized the talent of both Jefferson and Hamilton. However, moving forward, there's going to be a lot of infighting because both Jefferson and Hamilton understood that whoever could gain Washington's favor could get their policy pushed forth. And both of these individuals are going to seek out Washington's favor, especially as we enter the next year, 1790. But ultimately, it's going to be Alexander Hamilton who is going to gain Washington's favor during this period, largely because he had served with Washington ever since the uh, American Revolution. He had known him lo much longer than Jefferson, and Washington had much more trust in Hamilton than he did with Jefferson. Now. Hamilton will really start to push forth his policy behind the Washington administration come the following year when he proposes to Congress his, what are called his reports on uh, public credit. Now, being in charge of the Treasury Department, Hamilton understood that he had one glaring issue he needed to resolve, the debt crisis that had developed as a result of America's involvement within their own revolution. Now, even with the creation of the new constitution, immediately the debt that had been acquired by the states was still there. It did not evaporate. And the federal government had to figure out how they could handle this and get rid of this debt and begin to pay it off to help restore American, America's credit. And what Hamilton's solution is, is he will argue that the federal government should assume the debts of the states as well as individuals from across the nation that had been acquired during the revolution. 
It would be added under a new branch, or I shouldn't say a new branch of the federal government. Eventually, it would be added under the Bank of the United States. And from there, with the new powers to issue taxes, tariffs, and so on and so forth, the federal government would generate that revenue to pay off these taxes. However, many individuals are going to be very distraught by this assumption plan because we need to understand one thing. Even though there was a large amount of debt that had been acquired across the nation as a result of the revolution, some states like Virginia and many states in the South had been fiscally responsible. They had paid off almost all of their debt, if not uh, most of it. Whereas many northern states, especially in Massachusetts, had not been fiscally responsible and had not paid off their debts. And individuals like Jefferson and Madison, this is where they're going to start to split away from the Federalists. They're going to disagree with Hamilton. They're going to argue, well, I should say especially Madison, is going to argue that the southern states should not inquire the debts of the northern states, that it was their responsibility. And he will halt uh, um, Hamilton's uh, assumption plan within Congress. However, through a compromise between Hamilton, Jefferson, and Madison, we will see that he will get, or Hamilton would ultimately get his policy pushed through. Madison would consent that he would uh, uh, convince some senators, with, or I shouldn't say senators, some members of the House of Representatives to support Hamilton's assumption plan in exchange for allowing Southerners to build the federal capital, the permanent federal capital, in a region in the South, specifically along the Potomac River, where we see Washington, D.C. today. And so that was a major compromise at the time, and it looked like political infighting might come to a halt. However, this is only one of the few, fa or one of the several phases as a part of Hamilton's fiscal policy. Now, from assuming the debts of the states, he wanted the federal government to begin to pay it off. The reason being is because this would begin to increase America's credit, to convince especially Europeans to provide America with more loans, to help fuel American business, the federal government, and so on and so forth. The next major step in his fiscal policies to encourage economic growth by restoring American credit and then building on uh, American manufacturing would be to construct a Bank of the United States. And this is a big one that's going to divide these two, two political factions. Now, the Bank of the United States, the purpose for it was, is it was supposed to be basically, I don't want to say a branch of the government, but it would be the bank of the federal government to where it would hold its loan or hold its revenue it would pay its bills it would uh, issue out currency and so on and so forth but it could also issue out loans to private businesses the bank of the united states in order to do this had to be privately owned but nonetheless it would be a part of the federal government it would be on a federal charter that had to be renewed by congress every uh, 20 years and he will propose this idea to Congress. However, it's not going to be wildly popular. Both Madison as well as Jefferson, who are wildly suspicious of banks, are going to state that if they allow the creation of this Bank of the United States, since it's privately owned and operated and it's not actually part of the federal government, it could create a corrupt class in Washington. And on top of that, they're going to uh, further state that in the Constitution, it does not directly state that there should be a Bank of the United States. And so they will heavily oppose this. And along a sectional vote, the Bank of the United States in 1791 will barely, or its charter will barely pass through Congress. And it will come into effect for the next 20 years. But many individuals, especially Jefferson and Madison, and many of these Republicans are going to be suspicious. And really with the Bank of the United States, it creates this uh, permanent um, breach between the Federalists as well as the Republicans to where they will grow more hostile towards each other over the coming days. But for the time being, Hamilton would be able to get his bank established. Now the purpose for this bank was to acquire much of those debts, begin to pay them off, generate, or uh, re, um, what's the word I'm looking for? To uh, revitalize, yeah, revitalize American credit, and on top of that, provide loans for American manufacturing because he saw America as being a grand manufacturing power, very much in contrast to what the Jeffersonians will see, and we'll talk about that when we get to his presidency. But it would prove to be divisive, and we'll see for years to come, Republicans are going to heavily oppose any sort of aspects of the Bank of the United States. But anyways, as we start to see this political clout begin to develop, we're moving further in our timeline now to 1792. And we're coming up on the second presidential election in American history, but even though we start to see America break into these political factions, Washington is going to rise above the political noise. Now, he had been reluctant to run in 1792, but he will be convinced by Jefferson. And in that year, he would uh, once again win unanimously, 
And he would go out stating that America should condemn these political parties and that they should unite under one voice. So obviously, that won't be the case in future American politics, but that was his hope. And as he enters his second presidential term, though, while he has to deal with this political infighting within his own cabinet, as well as between these two political factions, he has to deal with other issues. Foreign issues that were beginning to emerge as France was gripped by revolution in a very similar way that the United States had been gripped just a decade prior. Now, at the beginning of the Washington administration in 1789, as we see the Constitution go into effect, France is going to be gripped by revolution. Shortly after the American Revolution, much of the rhetoric of America's own revolution was beginning to arrive over in France, which was under an absolute monarch, that of King Louis XVI. Well, not a lot of people are going to like King Louis XVI, mainly because he would hold these elaborate balls with uh, basically like steak dinners, if you will, in the midst of famines. And in 1789, the people having enough of this after experiencing a recent famine are going to rise up against their own government to create a representative government. At first, they'll be somewhat of a constitutional monarchy, but over time, they will eventually throw out King Louis XVI and create a legitimate republic. And many Americans, especially the Jefferson Jeffersonian faction are going to heavily support the French Revolution, as they see the French fighting a very similar fight to what they had fought just prior to this. However, in the year 1792 and then into 1793, with France being engulfed in revolution, and since it was one of the largest European states at the time, many monarchs from all over Europe are going to look to suppress the French, revol or French uh, revolutionaries. And we'll start to see that by the or in 1793, the world is going to go off to war, as this will turn into a global conflict that will last the course of the next 20 years. However, as we see France go off to war with these other European powers, they will constantly appeal to the United States for their aid, as they believe they were bound through the Treaty of Alliance of 1778 to come to France's aid, since basically everybody was against France. However, Washington, he understood from the beginning of the French Revolution that this would be completely foolish. He understood to get involved in the revolution would spell disaster for the U.S., who was just barely beginning to be able to pay off their own debt from, the, uh, from their own revolution. And so Washington is going to do something that will be unpopular with Jefferson as well as the Republicans. He's going to declare full neutrality. He will not want to side with either the British or the French in this conflict. And he will state that they must respect America's right as a neutral nation to trade with each respective power. However, that will prove problematic in the days to come. But nonetheless, there will be several French revolutionaries who will still try to convince Americans to get involved in the conflict. Most notably of these would be citizen Edmund Charles Guenet, who was a French ambassador over to the United States in 1793. However, for the time being, we'll see that America will stay out of this conflict as a result of his neutrality act. But with the issuance of his Neutrality Act, Jefferson in particular, his Secretary of State, was under the impression that he had been heavily influenced by Hamilton, and that he was taking a firmly pro-British stance as, well, as opposed to a pro-French stance. And Jefferson, by the end of the year, growing tired of the fighting between him and Hamilton within Washington's cabinet, is going to resign from his post. However, this could be the least of Washington's worries at this point, even though he tries to keep Jefferson in that position. Because as we enter the next year, 1794, Washington will have to deal with other issues that were much closer to home than the French Revolution. So as the French Revolution was raging, Washington's also going to have to deal with several issues that were much closer to home, especially in regards to domestic issues. Now, as we enter the year 1794, as well as 1795, Washington's going to have to de uh, deal with issues out along the frontier in regards to Native American raids against settlements. And you can read about that with the Northwest uh, Indian War. However, more specifically, in the year 1794, Washington's going to have to deal with a domestic issue that will threaten to topple, or perhaps topple, the federal government. He will see an armed rebellion take place out in western Pennsylvania. Now, part of Hamilton's uh, financial, or I shouldn't say financial, as a part of his economic policies, he also pushed forth new innovative tax, most notably that of a tax on distilled spirits or on whiskey, which is going to outrage uh, uh, farmers out on the frontier who grew wheat when, and with this wheat, whenever they weren't selling off to market to produce, obviously later on, uh, bread, they would use their excess wheat to produce whiskey, a major source of their income, especially during the winter months. However, 
With this tax that was placed against whiskey, it will heavily impact their livelihoods and their lifestyle as they were not making as much in profits. And by 1794, believing that the federal government had expanded too much its federal authority under this tax, there will be several thousand whiskey rebels who will take up arms, begin to burn down towns and villages all throughout western Pennsylvania, and threaten to burn down Pittsburgh. Now, when they make this threat, they even threaten to march even further and go to Washington, D.C. with their case. And Washington's going to have to respond relatively strong to ensure that rebellions like this one will not occur in the future. He will call for the raising of an army of about 12,500 men from the state of Virginia, and he will personally lead it at least halfway out into Pennsylvania to show that the Whiskey Rebels he meant force and that he would forcibly suppress that rebellion. Now, when uh, his... Uh, when his uh, army does arrive out in western Pennsylvania, most of those whiskey rebels are going to step down from their position. And they realize that moving forward, that it probably wasn't a good idea to confront the federal government with arms through violence, but rather they should try to, through the ballot box, take those politicians out of office who had instituted these taxes. And many of these Western farmers, because of things like the whiskey tax, will begin to lean to the Republican faction. And that will begin to change American politics as we start to see not only Southerners supporting the uh, Republican Party, but also Westerners. And that will prove crucial, especially as we get to the end of this period. Meanwhile, as he was dealing with these issues back at home, as he was entering the last couple of years of his administration, Washington's also going to have to continue to deal with foreign crisis issues, especially surrounding that French Revolution. Now, after declaring his neutrality, both France as well as Britain, and mainly Britain, are going to begin to seize American ships that were bound for the other powers' uh, ports. Now, Britain in particular will begin to pillage American ships that were bound to France, supplying them most notably with things like lumber. And through this practice, they will also begin to be, uh, begin a um, practice of what will be called impressment, to where they would not only seize the cargoes of these ships, but begin to impress sailors into the British Navy. Now, it won't be widespread during the 1790s, but it will become much more widespread by the time we get to the early 1800s. Now, as Great Britain was seizing American ships and violating sailor rights out at sea, many Americans were beginning to call for war against Great Britain. And now there was an anti-British uh, uh, feeling that was widespread across the nation. However, still in 1795, less than a decade after the Constitution had taken effect, Washington still understood that to get involved in a European war would spell disaster for the United States. So he will send one John Jay over to England to broker a deal to hopefully avoid war at all costs, while also trying to regain American shipping rights. Now, I think it's also noteworthy as a part of um, uh, our discussion about Jay's Treaty, I had mentioned earlier that there was a Indian war off in the American Northwest. Well, the uh, British were also um, they were also providing a great amount of funds as well as weapons to the uh, Native Americans who were conducting these raids. And so Americans were further outraged by this. However, they will be extremely outraged, and especially the Republican faction will be outraged when Jay sends back the treaty he established with the British government. Now, America at this time, it's important for us to recognize, was not the superpower, or at least not even half the superpower that it is today. It really didn't have any bargaining chips. The mightiest nation in the world at the time was the British Empire, and they aren't going to really listen to any of uh, America's demands. And through Jay's treaty, America, while they will gain some things, while they will have some British soldiers abandon forts out on the frontier, establish a few borders and so on and so forth, for the most part, Jay's treaty isn't going to address that issue of British ships seizing American ships with French goods. The British will actually state within this treaty that they will have that right to do it if those American ships were bound for a French port. And when word of this treaty arrives back in the United States, it's going to bring about widespread outrage, especially from the Republicans, who will begin some murmurs about potentially impeaching President Washington. However, even despite these, this outrage from the Republican faction, and even though there were protests before the, I don't want to say the White House because the White House wasn't in existence yet, but before the presidential office, Washington nonetheless is going to stand strong by his treaty. And eventually this uh, anti jace treaty fe feeling will begin to die down, especially as uh, Pinckney's treaty, which was signed with the Spanish, will become available, and that will become widely popular. But Nonetheless, Jay's treaty will impact events to come because by the end of the Washington administration, it will begin what's known as a quasi-war with France, who would themselves be outraged at the fact that 
the Washington, I should say, the Americans were more willing to make concessions to the British than they were with the French. And this is something that Washington's next, uh, or his successor, is going to have to deal with when he takes over in office. Now, in late 1796, after eight years of being in office, Washington, he could run for election that year. However, he's going to decide not to. He's going to step aside. And this is where he will set a precedent to where presidents, even though there was no term limit, will serve two terms before stepping down from power. And that won't be broken until we get to uh, the 20th century. But anyways, he will step down from power, and in 18, or 1796, we will see America's first contested election because somebody other than Washington would be on the ballot. And the Federalists and the Republicans are going to look to seize on this opportunity to get their individual elected into office. And the two principal individuals who will be running in 1796 would be that of the Federalist John Adams against his old friend, the Republican Thomas Jefferson. Now, neither candidate is going to go out and give campaign rallies or speeches and so on and so forth. They're going to have members of their party campaign on their behalf, and they're not actually going to accept any sort of nomination at this point. That wasn't an American tradition yet. But anyways, after a very mean and nasty campaign, the individual who would gain the most electoral votes would be that of John Adams. However, who would become his vice president will be the individual who gained the second most electoral votes, which would be the Republican Thomas Jefferson. And over the course of the next four years, it will be a very awkward situation within the presidential uh, um, house because of the fact that you see two rival factions inhabiting the White House, and we'll, or not the White House, the President's House at this time. But anyways, we'll see how this will impact how both parties will try to approach the next presidential election in 1800. But effectively, Adams would begin his administrative term on March 4th, um, on March 4th, 1797. And when he begins his administration, he promises to Americans that he would carry on the legacy of Washington and he also makes it clear that he will want to continue to expand the federal government. Now, Adams is going to inherit many of the issues that were lingering over from the Washington administration. And the biggest one that he's going to inherit is going to be that of the quasi-war with France. Now, with this quasi-war with France, as I mentioned a moment ago, it was mainly because the French were outraged at the fact that the Americans had signed a treaty with the British. And they felt betrayed by this. And French ships will begin to seize American ships that were bound for Great Britain. And as we had seen before Jay's Treaty, there was a great amount of anti-British sentiment in the United States. The pendulum is going to swing because by the time we get to the uh, Adams administration, with this quasi-war beginning to develop, there's going to now be anti-French sentiment. However, Adams, like Washington before him, even though he was short-tempered, he understood that the worst thing for the nation in this early period was to go off to war because one, they were ill-prepared, and two, it could bankrupt them and it could lead to their destruction. And just like Washington before him, he's going to look to negotiate his way out of this mess with the French. He's going to send over three delegates to go over to France to strike up a deal and hopefully calm these tensions that had developed following Jay's treaty. However, his negotiating effort is going to end in complete failure with what's called the XYZ Affair. Now, the XYZ Affair, what we're going to see is when the three American delegates arrive over in France, the French uh, delegates are going to demand that the Americans give them a $250,000 bribe. It's worth a lot more today, but that was the demand they made at the time. And that any, a part of any peace negotiation, on top of that bribe, one of the terms had to be the Americans would have to give them another $12 million in funds. Once again, more today. However, this will outrage the American delegates who would send word back to Adams. And when it arrives back to Adams, word of this XYZ affair, as it becomes known, would be leaked to the press. Americans will be outraged, and there would be calls for war against France at this moment. And Adams will begin to raise, or I should say Congress will raise the size of the Navy, raise the size of the Army, bring Washington out of retirement, put him at the head of the Army, and begin to prepare for war. However, still, Adams was hopeful that he could avoid war as he realized that time was his best prospect, that hopefully time would heal all wounds. But Congress, now seized by the Federalists, is going to continue to advance their anti-French agenda, which will outrage the Republicans and it will eventually lead to the most disgraceful acts to be passed by Congress that will limit the First Amendment right of the right to free speech. And it will be the acts, or the acts known as the Alien and Sedition Acts. Now, the Alien and Sedition Acts, both of them are going to be published in 1798, and they will be signed by Adams, I'll add here. 
they're going to greatly restrict Americans' First Amendment rights. Now, first through the Alien Act, it's going to specifically target French nationalists as well as Irish nationalists. Now, we can understand why it's targeting the French nationalists because of the anti-French fever that uh, has developed, and they believe that most French immigrants at this time were entering the nation trying to spew uh, radical rhetoric to overthrow the American government. That wasn't true, but that was the belief of the Federalists. But the reason they'll target Irish uh, immigrants as well is because they were also anti-British. And so that's why they will be included in this clause. However, Adams himself, he wasn't particularly fond of the Alien Act, and he won't enforce it. He won't actually de deport anybody. However, he will enforce this next act, that of the Sedition Acts, which will not target immigrants arriving over in the United States, but rather would target American citizens. Now, through the Sedition Acts, basically what it says is that if you say anything ill or bad towards the administration, if you talk crap about them, you could be arrested. And Adams will employ this act, and there will be hundreds of individuals who will be arrested as part of the Sedition Acts. Moving forward, the Republicans are going to have to be very careful with much of their rhetoric. However, the Alien and Sedition Acts, they are going to completely undermine the Adams administration. Because while they may have been or seem popular at the time by many Americans in 1798, by the time we get to the next presidential election, it was a disaster for Adams. It demonstrated that he was willing to bend the Constitution too much and break some of the amendments, a part of the Bill of Rights that the founders had fought so hard for. And in the election of 1800, so no surprise, while Adams will run as a Federalist candidate, the other candidate, Jefferson once again, running on the Republican ticket, he will come in and gain the White House. Now, the election of 1800, which you'll read in an article this week, it will be a highly contested election that will test the American Republic because it will test America's electoral system. What will happen in the election of 1800 is that America's electoral system it had declared that whoever gained the most votes or most electoral votes became the president, whoever gained the second most became the vice president. However, two individuals, both Republicans, Aaron Burr as well as Thomas Jefferson, they had an equal number of electoral votes. And neither one of them wanted to concede the White House at this point. And they will take their contested election before the House of Representatives, which was inhabited by mostly Federalists, who did not want to see their great rival uh, Jefferson gain the presidency. In February of 1801, as the House of Representatives was beginning to decide who would win this contested election, America's future was in, er, in its hands. Many wondered that if Congress could not agree on who would become the next president, would Adams remain as president? Would he stay in power for the foreseeable future, or would he leave office and there would be no president? Ballot after ballot would be cast in the House of Representatives. However, on the 36th ballot, Jefferson would be declared the winner. But this would create a lot of ill feelings between him and Aaron Burr for the years to come. But with Jefferson's victory in the election of 1800, it ensured that the Federalists would not come back to political prominence, as the uh, political pendulum had swung once again. And this time in favor of the Republicans who will dominate the White House for the course of the next 24 years and would inaugurate a new era, one that would not be based in building a stronger centralized government, but rather in creating perhaps a weaker centralized government, or promoting this idea of Republican simplicity that we'll talk about next time. But anyways, that brings us to an end of this uh, lecture. Uh, before I go ahead and end, just like always, make sure that uh, before you watch the next lecture video, that you go out and complete any outstanding assignments, complete all the readings associated with this video, as well as read through the textbook that corresponds with this topic. But anyways, without further ado, I'll see you all next time.